Welcome to Branding Innovators, a live video podcast series event that is coming to you from the Creative and Tech Podcast Show powered by Readspeaker.ai. I am your host and moderator for this event. My name is Carrie Roberts, and I'm the brand evangelist for North America at Readspeaker.ai. And today, this conversation is a panel discussion about the value of brand and how to stand out. And I have four incredibly talented and creative people joining this discussion. And just to introduce them and welcome them, I have Jorge Almeida. He is the digital marketing manager at Avocados from Mexico. Welcome, Jorge. Hello. And we have Steve Keller. He is the Sonic Strategy Director at Sirius XM Studio Resonate. Welcome, Steve. Hi there. We have CJ Ye. He is the Founder Executive Creative Chair at Cinda Media Lab, as well as the Curriculum Chair for Creative Technology and Design at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. Welcome, CJ. Thank you for having me. And we have Joe Quatrone. He is the Senior Vice President and Head of Education, Head of Sasha West at the Sasha Group, which is part of the VaynerX organization owned by Gary Vaynerchuk. Welcome. Excited to have you here as well, Joe. Thanks. Happy to be here. So I have been asking this to each of our guests for this event, and I'm doing it for everyone because I think it's interesting uh, to talk about the definition of brand. So I'm going to start with you, Jorge, and have you each answer this question. How do you define the word brand in simplest of terms? So loaded question from the start, right? But I think uh, based on my experience on the agency side and, and a big brand and then now with a smaller brand, I think branding in a simple one sentence is any any emotions and, and feelings that are evoked from looking at something, right? To me, branding needs to be an emotional thing, uh, not just a functional thing. So to me, branding equates to, to feelings. That you that you get uh, when you look or hear about a brand. CJ, anything to add to that? How would you define the word brand? Sure, um, I totally agree with what he was saying. And being a teacher slash creative director for my own studio, so I'm going to kind of um, chime in from two perspective. Um, the textbook um, definition of branding, of course, is branding is a process of giving a meaning to a specific organization, company, product, or services by creating and shaping a brand in consumer's mind. So it's like what he was talking about. It's an emotional connection. It's a story people tell when they hear your, your brand. It's a memory they have about your company or services. It's a gut feeling. Now, on the other side, what really excites me as a creative is, I believe branding is a total design. What I mean is it uses language, image, sound, motion, interaction, typography, layout, smells, tactile feelings, all that is actually part of the total brand experience. That's what excites me. Yeah, I agree. I love that. Steve, anything to add here on your definition of brand? Yeah, I mean, I I think we're kind of, uh, you know, converging. Um, I really love what CJ was saying from a multi-sensory pers perspective. You know, a brand is really about perception. Uh, we get fooled into thinking that, oh, it's the product is the brand. And that's not the case. Or the logo is the brand. I mean, these are all pieces that can factor into branding. But at the end of the day, the brand is what resides in the consumer's mind. And that's all about perception. And so the process of branding is how are we hacking senses to shape perception that we believe is also going to drive behavior. Uh, and so we can talk about, you know, the assets um, from a sensory standpoint and how we design those, how we create those, how we try to align brand intent with consumer perception. Uh, but at the end of the day, it really is that emotional connection that's drawn from a multi-sensory experience of the brand. And, and how we're creating that. Yes, I love that defini definition as well. Joe, anything to add here that we haven't said about how you define brand? Yeah, I'll just um, give everyone a something quick to remember this by, because I agree with everything that everybody said thus far, but something simple that's uh, really stood out for me since about the mid 2000s when I read it was Marty Neumeier's The Brand Gap. And um, what he goes on to say in that book is the brand is not what you say it is, it's what your consumers say it is. So if you just remember that quick little anecdote, 
it shows you kind of how to approach things and what filter and lens to, to view it through, right? It's not good enough for me to, to think about shaping a brand in a certain way. It's only gonna matter when I communicate a vision and communicate that repetitively over time uh, to a consumer and they really understand the values that I'm conveying over a long horizon. Um, so it's not about what you think it is, it's about what your consumers say it is. That's your brand. Yes, which I think is a challenge because sometimes people want to say, well, this is what I want to be, but you don't always get that choice, which brings me to the question of what makes a great brand? And are there maybe some examples of a great brand that either you see out in the world or maybe someone you've worked with or your own brand? And CG, I'm going to start with you on that question. Sure. Oh, that, that's a tough question. When I saw that one, like there's so many different great brands and what should I talked about. So I decided to really break it down into different kinds of pleasure that the product or company can bring uh, to people. So we can talk about physical pleasure, meaning the touch, the tactile feelings. A lot of people actually don't notice that uh, Apple is really good at this, actually. Their product feels great. Touch is great. That material is very important. They're the, one of the first technology brands that really pay attention to material. It's not just a plastic box and the social pleasure and which means that you purchase product because it it shows your social status in some way and uh, i think rolls royce is a great example of that you don't ride rolls royce because you want to go from point, point a to point b you ride uh, you ride rolls royce because you have already arrived <laughs> it's a social <laughs> but uh, the, the status uh, symbol you can have the, we can talk about psychological pleasure I think BMW in that regard is a great brand. The ultimate driving machine, right? It's all the like, excitement you get from their product. And ideal pleasure, I think Dove has been doing a great job. I think they're really starting to pay attention to the real beauty, embrace your own beauty. And I think that campaign is probably one of the best brand campaign in my, in my mind uh, in the past five, 10, 15 years. I like that. I have never thought about brand in those ways. But when you say that, that makes a lot of sense. Now, Jorge, you work for a brand. So I'm curious, you know, whether you're thinking about your own that you work for or others, what makes a great brand and what are kind of some examples that showcase that? So I won't talk about my brand, uh, but I'll talk about another one. I will give a boring answer to to start is that one of the things that's important on a brand is having standards and, and specifically brand standards. So I know agencies know this well because it comes from the brand side uh, directives but the the point on standards is that that's the only way you can achieve consistency across all touch points right and to the first question of what is branding well branding has also changed right uh, because of digital technology and I'm sure we're we'll talk a little bit about that but back to the the question and the example I mean I have to go with Nike which I bet a lot of people are oh, typical right but but I look at it more from a perspective of of as an athlete myself, I'm a runner. Uh, Carrie, you know this. I think I, I'm extra critical on their ads, and I just love how every ad doesn't matter what sport, what Olympics, World Cup. They're they're just always about the athlete, right? They're so focused in and honed in on on the fact that they you know exist to basically you know support and push the athlete forward, right? So I just love like Nike, love all their work, and that swoosh just means so much, right? You could see it like on a sidewalk. And people, you know, preparing for a 5K can get inspired if they see a little Nike swoosh on the sidewalk, you know, in some guerrilla marketing tactics. So, so yeah, there's a lot that a brand needs to have. The logo, potentially a jingle. I'll talk a little bit about the, the powers of, of jingles in a little bit. Uh, but I think uh, more than anything, a great example is Nike. From everything that they do, they're consistent. Everyone recognizes that swoosh. And, and I think that's what's so powerful is their message goes global, right? It doesn't matter who you're talking to, people, uh, if you're an athlete or even if you're not but you're trying to be one you can see a nike ad and you'll feel inspired to get up off the couch and do something you know yeah i like that i think again you know what you kind of added there to cj's is about again this this feeling this emotion you have this connection you have to it as you mentioned being a runner uh, so that makes a lot of sense Joe, what are your thoughts here on what makes a great brand? You know, we talk, uh, you work for a company that Gary Vaynerchuk owns. I mean, talk about somebody who's talking about brand all the time um, and, and what we're looking at. What do you feel makes a great brand? And maybe some examples that you can share as well. well there's a lot of things that make a great brand, but I, I think uh, values is one that is particularly important to me. And an example that I think um, is kind of a little bit off the beaten path 
Um, they're in, in, back at, uh, when they were rolling out the vaccines in LA, the LA Times published an article about uh, the Dodger, Dodger Stadium vaccine lines, six, seven, 8,000 people a day. And it was a complete chaos, complete zoo. Who do you think they called to figure out how to process those lines quicker? They called the Chick-fil-A regional manager, right? <laughs> so they brought Chick-fil-A in and they, they consulted Chick-fil-A on how to process a line and get people through in a much more smoother fashion to have a much greater experience in getting the vaccine. Because as we all know, a lot of politicians are really talking about getting vaccines in arms and, and stopping the, the spread of the virus. Uh, so having a great experience in line was important for the rollout of the vaccine and they call Chick-fil-A. So I think it's interesting. I think Chick-fil-A, even though you may not agree with their politics and I'm not here to talk about how great their politics are, um, what they do value is making sure that customers have an amazing experience in their store. It starts with a friendly smile. It starts with un listening uh, and, and taking in an order properly. It starts with, uh, you know, it goes into understanding the logistics of how to actually get people through in, a mo in the most uh, seamless fashion. And they do that better than any anybody else in the world. I've often said to my wife, you know, if I could have Chick-fil-A run the, the DMV in the post office, I absolutely would. Uh, there were one, the one, if you want to get chicken, there's no better place to go to than Chick-fil-A. But that's my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I love, you know, I, it's interesting that you just brought that up. You talked about even just the brand, how a brand like Chick-fil-A can use just the idea of how to get through a line more efficiently and have a better experience, how that can be part of a brand. And then even the brand of the vaccine, how can we make this a better experience? I never thought about that that way before. Steve, anything to add here in terms of what makes a great brand and any companies that you've seen that have do it really well? Yeah, I'll, I'll throw out uh, a couple more that, that haven't been mentioned. Um, you know, one that's top of mind for me is McDonald's. Um, and you know, when you think about consistency, as Jorge was was talking about, uh, I travel a lot. I can be anywhere in the world, and you know, when I'm at a McDonald's, it feels home to me. Whether I can understand the language that's printed on the menu or not, I still know what I'm going to order. I still know what it's going to taste like at the end of the day. Um, and certainly, McDonald's uh, for me is high on the list because they've got uh, a really distinctive audio asset. You know, with their ba da ba ba ba, uh, and the story behind building that and creating something that was congruent and and flexible uh, enough that it could be adapted across all these global cultures. So I think there's a way that um, McDonald's has been able to to capture and still capture um, mental availability, uh, which is really important for a brand. Uh, another brand that I'll mention that probably isn't on everyone's radar, but it's fascinating to me, um, particularly from an audio standpoint, is Burberry, the, the fashion brand, uh, and how, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a British brand. Uh, and years ago, they decided to lean into that. And when you often think about the UK, and particularly London, you usually think about the weather. Uh, and so that's what they have leaned into in their branding. So in, in kind of these overcast um, hues in the background, uh, they make a big deal about rain uh, in their fashion shows. They've literally made it rain in some of the shows. Uh, they've, they've really played up independent artists, an independent spirit, um, a particular sound that's very organic. Uh, for the brand isn't at all cliche of what you might think about for a fashion brand. Uh, and so uh, I think they've done a really great job of, of capturing this perception of Britain, of London, and it's really a part of the DNA of, of the, of the brand. Uh, so that's just an example, I think, of a, of a brand that's done some unique things experientially and taps all of our, our senses. I feel like just in the last eight minutes, you've just been talking. I think we just really pushed the level of what a brand can be. Again, from talking about little everyday things like a line to, like you said, the experience or the feeling that I have, things I certainly haven't thought of before, which I think is important to point out. Um, Audrey is here. She's actually a part of our event as well. She said very true to everything we are talking about. If you are watching, you're welcome to put in a question and we can answer it later as well. Um, you know, a lot of companies, uh, you all know this, working at the companies you do and other companies you have in the past are always talking about ROI. 
What is the ROI of this in terms of money back and sales? So Joe, I'm going to start with you on this question. What value does a brand bring and how do you measure it in terms of metrics so that those that are asking what the ROI is can have something that makes them feel good, like it's working? Uh, I think you first have to kind of, you know, break it down and understand how you measure brand versus what you're measuring in the rest of your ecosystem. So I don't think brand is something you measure the same way you would measure effectiveness of like TV advertising or social media or billboards. Uh, brand is long-term value, right? And I, I think of it much the same way I think about selling a house or selling, you know, something of, of intrinsic monetary value. It is what it is worth what somebody will pay for it, right? So a lot of people didn't think Facebook was going to be worth a billion dollars when uh, when it was evaluated at, at a billion dollars, but you have to understand, like if Mark Zuckerberg ever wanted to sell Facebook, he could sell it for far more than a billion dollars. And this is, you know, dates back more than 10 years. Um, so I think you have to think about it in a much longer term horizon, right? It, than, than measuring it on a, a year to year, quarter, quarter to quarter basis. You can certainly go out and you could feel the brand health study. You can do it over a long-term horizon and you can kind of sort of get to uh, what the consumers feel about your brand over time. That gives you a nice little directional feel of what your brand is worth. Uh, but nothing is, you know, you know, concrete and set in stone. Your brand value is what somebody would pay for it uh, down the road or now. Um, and it's, a, it's worth a lot more than you think it is in, in a lot of cases. Uh, so keep that in mind. It's not something that I would ever pit against you know, the ROI of a, you know, social media ad spend, um, that those are just apples and oranges and they're not something that should ever be really compared. Yes. CJ, anything to add here from your perspective on, in terms of, you know, what value does a brand bring and any metrics or things that you could give in response to somebody asking what's the ROI? Sure. Um, we, we live in the age of, um, big data. So actually, there's a lot easier ways that we can find out a, a lot about a brand. For example, brand awareness. We can find the search volume, social media mentions, reviews. We can have data uh, media mentions easily, easily tracked. We can have preference metrics about your brand relevancy, uh, accessibility, emotional connections, and the value like Joe was talking about. We have channel partner engagement, which can be uh, measured as well. And of course, we have financial metrics, store sales, average uh, transaction value. So all of those data can be calculated. So I agree with Joe, it is long term, but uh, more and more these days, people pay attention to brand because we can prove it. We can prove it with data and numbers. Yes, this works. But one thing to add on to that, CJ, brand is in all of those things. So it is part of everything you're measuring. Um, so just another little argument for why you keep brand off to the side and you measure it in a completely holistically different way. Brand is in all of the, your touch points. I agree. Yep. Yeah, Steve, uh, your thoughts here, you know, because we're talking about data, um, you know, quantitative data is important, but so is qualitative data. So again, in your mind, where does brand kind of bring value and any thoughts on measurement from your perspective? Well, I, I you know, I, I think we've, we've touched on everything. Certainly, I will drill in a little bit more, to, uh, you know, looking at metrics around brand from a from a sonic perspective, and a lot of folks don't think about that um, at all. Uh, you know, how do, how do I measure um, what my sonic experience of my brand uh, is is doing? Uh, and I I also think you know I, I have a pet peeve when I hear ROI because I I think a lot of times that's it's bogus. Um, you know, it's, it's somebody trying to justify a decision that I've made. And if somebody can tell me I'm going to see a return on my ROI, I've got the, you know, I can, I can justify it. ROI is a particular metric. Um, it's a, it's a formula. Uh, and sometimes uh, that's not the right metric. Uh, you have to look at different metrics. But I think what's interesting to me is the research on the brand shows us, particularly if you look at Peter Feld. Um, and uh, Les Bennett's, uh look at long-term brand building versus short-term sales activation, uh, you know, transactional marketing messaging. That works. That does give you a lift. But if you're concentrating on building a brand over time, 
if you look at the econometric data, we realize that if you're effective in building a brand in making those emotional connections, brands that do that can yield twice the revenue of brands that are simply concentrating on that short-term sales activation. So I think that's an important distinction when you're talking about ROI of branding, that branding and marketing are related, but they're two different things. Uh, and so when you're looking at metrics, you need to look at metrics, as CJ was saying, that are looking at perceptual, behavioral, purchase, finance, but are really more related to that brand building and the brand experience that Joe just said is across all of the, the touch points. Um, and mm -hmm. so there's a lot of ways and a lot of metrics we can use. And, um, you know, I think you just have to be aware of what is it you're trying to measure and then what's the best metric to measure that uh, instead of just a catch all term of ROI. Yes. I also like that you said branding and marketing are different. I think they complement each other, but a lot of times they're lumped in together, but they are two different things. Jorge, anything to add to what these three gentlemen had said in terms of what we're talking about here? So much to add. I'll keep it short though. And, and yeah, the <laughs> comment, it's branding and marketing that's different. And then you bring in the sales equation, right? And what Steve was talking about is so important is you have to think short-term volume driving, right? But you also have to think long-term. And I think most brands have a hard time trying to balance both, right? Because it's conceded efforts on, on the short term piece, but then you might, you know, neglect branding, long term branding. But then if you focus too much on brand building, how can you prove ROI, right? And I think as marketers in general, we need to do a better job at trying to connect our marketing efforts to, you know, short term volume, you know, dollar sales. And that's a little difficult at times, right? Uh, but but anyways, not to go much into that, I think one one uh, two things I'll say. And one example is actually when Joe was talking about how brand is everywhere and actually made me think of Coca-Cola. Right. So there's a lot going on in the soft drinks industry and things like that. But how is it that a brand like Coca-Cola can own polar bears and Santa Claus everywhere? Right. It doesn't matter. Right. And that just shows what Joe and, and CJ and Steve is talking about, like the value of a brand. How can you quantify that Coca-Cola owns Santa Claus and Polar Bear, right? Everyone associates Coca-Cola with that. So anyways, that's just a little side note. But when you when you talk about ROI, it's, it's so difficult, right? And I think one example that I'll speak from my personal experience and my current role is that Avocados from Mexico, we have had uh, recent investments into Super Bowl. Right. And that's one of those things that always gets questioned. Right. It's the Mecca of advertising. All advertisers want to be present at Super Bowl. But when you look at the investment itself, you're talking about upwards of four million dollars just for 30 seconds. Right. And that doesn't even include all the other production costs and everything that goes into a Super Bowl spot. So our CEO says this all the time. If you look at a, a Super Bowl effort and you just try to come and to numbers with the ROI of spending you know, upwards of $5 million, $6 million on a 30-second spot, then of course the ROI doesn't make sense. But what something like Super Bowl does is it gives you an excuse, right? To build a campaign you know, a month out, right? And then launch teasers two weeks prior, get people excited. And to us, it's, it's such a great thing to, to participate in, even though we're not an official sponsor of the NFL. So talk about guerrilla marketing, that's a whole nother subject. But uh, the, what we do is, you know, it's, it's hard to quantify, but there's nothing like people are preparing for their game day viewing experience and they're in the store and they're thinking of produce and what can I bring as a snack? And then they're like, oh wait, I just saw an avocados from Mexico, jingle commercial, a teaser, like, wow, let me make some guac for the big game, right? And that's something that, you know, it's hard to quantify that one, you know, experience people have might have it in store, but that's what we do this for. And it, it, it definitely benefits us, especially from broad awareness. So people understand we're a brand, but then from the short term piece, you know, making sure people have a delicious guacamole with our avocados, of course, for, for a big day, like Super Bowl. So some thoughts there. Yeah. Carrie, I, what, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say one thing that uh, I love the energy Steve brought or <laughs> hating when people bring ROI up when it comes to brand. One thing that I might do is I might flip it back on the, the asker of the question and say, what is the ROI of changing out your CMO every two years? Right. Because if you look at some of the 10 X brands, as Jim Collins likes to say, yeah. most of the brands that have been the most successful over the past 40, 50 years are the brands that have leadership installed over a multi-decade uh, period of time. So that, again, it kind of underscores the point that these brands are built over an extremely long period of time. The reason why Coca-Cola owns polar bears and Starbucks owns pumpkin spice is basically they've been 
flogging the market with those, uh, the, you know, those touch points and, and those tangible items for for multiple decades. If they were to pivot off of those strategies, they would present a very frenetic, choppy brand to the market, and um, and that's that's really the ROI of branding to me, right? It's it's you can't afford not to do it. You know? Yes, I am so excited about this, and I think you know to have the four of you, you know, at the the backgrounds you have, the levels that you're at in your career, saying this just really resonates. I think with a lot of people that are watching and listening today. Um, you know, we are kind of of improving and, and moving in a direction where there's much more technology, there's much more innovation than ever before, especially in the last year and a half. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about brand being about the look for many years. You know, now we're getting into with this sonic branding, with uh, voices, with voice technology, with, you know, VR and AR and all these different things that are kind of coming into fruition. Um you know, wherever that is, where do you think the importance of sound and voice branding kind of comes into play in terms of branding now and into the future? And Steve, of course, I'm going to start with you with this question. <laughs> yeah. And I'll try and keep it short because otherwise, <laughs> you know, now, now you're touching my, my passion point. Um, but, you know, to, to, to start with where we started, uh, you know, when you're thinking about a brand as a perceptual experience, sound is part of that perception. Uh, and for a long time, sound has been really undervalued. This is the last thing that's often thought about. And when it is thought about, it's relegated to, I've got a script, I need a voiceover, or, oh, I've got a video, wouldn't a piece of music underneath it be nice? And so all this time and energy and effort has gone into decisions that are being made. And then in the last hour, let's throw a hundred different tracks again against it and see which one works, or let's get a celebrity VO to read something. Uh, so, you know, I think what's happening as we've entered an age where audio is getting more and more important, we've got interfaces now where you're not seeing anything visually, you're not interacting textually. Uh, it's all with uh, audio and that perception. Uh, brands are being forced to think about how are we showing up in those spaces. Uh, and, and I think the danger is that old habits die hard. And so you get excited about, oh, we need a sonic identity. And what do you do? Well, you, all, you jump right to the tactics. Oh, I need an audio logo. I need a brand theme. I need a, a brand voice instead of stepping back and saying, and what's the strategy? How do I make choices that are consistent with other perceptual cues? How do I make a sonic choice that fits how the brand looks or feels or smells or tastes? And we know from research that when we make congruent experiences um, perceptually, it magnifies that experience. And so I think what you know, I want to encourage folks to do is move beyond thinking about the individual assets sonically and think about the whole, which is really other than the sum of the parts. Uh, and one more thing that I'll, I'll throw out before I shut up on this is that when it comes to voice specifically, uh, a passion of mine right now is looking at how sound um, is part of a racial construct and that we can hear race. And thinking about what are the choices we're making with voice and how are those being driven by perhaps implicit biases on the basis of folks who are making those choices uh, and looking at new research around that where we can practice sonic diversity and create a more diverse world instead of practicing the kind of segmentation where we only hear certain voices for a certain market segment, which I would argue is not market segmentation, but market segregation. Um, and that there's there are these kind of sonic red lines that we can can draw based on on color. And we need to to take a look at what's happening in the voice world, you know how we're choosing voices, how the tech is developing to hear the voices, what are the voices the tech is taking on to speak back to us. It's This is a whole other world that really does have an impact on your brand experience for multiple consumers. So 
anyway, you, uh, like I said, I'll get off on a tangent. I'll shut up. Yeah. Well, we have four very passionate people, which is why I had you all on here. We could talk for probably 10 hours because I love all of this. And I, I think you're right. You know, you're, you're doing some great work. Uh, Steve, I've been seeing it a lot of really working on what you just spoke about CJ, anything to add here, either directly to what Steve said, or just in terms of kind of where you see, you know, music voices, sound kind of playing a role in brand as we kind of get into kind of newer elements of technology. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, people all know about the sound logo, Intel inside, for example, probably, one of the most uh, famous logo people don't, don't see, but they hear it, right? And uh, there are other things too, uh, where sound and voices are so important. Uh, for example, Apple Crombie, in their store, they purposely play loud dance music because research shows that loud volume leads to sensory overload, which weaken their self-control, so they start buying. <laughs> and that's part of their brand experience as well. <clears throat> And some of the other things that people may not notice in product, for example, BMW, they have a whole engineering team just to adjust the sound of the door closing. You want to give you that sense of stability and power so you, you, it fits into the brand. So I think sound definitely is very important part. We don't see it, which I think is a problem with design education. We focus so much on logo. And I always, always joke, say logo is like a cherry on top of the cake. It's shiny, but that's not branding itself. That's just a symbol in the whole system. And people think that is branding. Absolutely not. Smell, for example, is very important for the brand as well. We don't see it, but it changes how you perceive and experience something. Yes, I am like, I am so excited. <laughs> Everything you all are sharing. Jorge, anything to add here, again, in terms of, you know, this kind of newer technology coming to fruition and where maybe audio, sound, voices, things like that can play a role in terms of brand. And I'll come in, CJ's making me hungry now thinking about <laughs> cakes and smell. Uh, but but yeah, I think two comments. One is, is you know, as someone, when I started my advertising career, I didn't believe in jingles. I was very hesitant. I was like, because I was like, come on guys, really, right? But now I've seen the power of it, right? And it's so strong. And, and I spoke a little bit about Avocados from Mexico and how powerful it's been for us to have a jingle, right? But I'll speak of other brands just to give examples of the auditory experience and how it helps. But uh, for, for a couple of years, Home Depot was our client. And Home Depot has this very recognizable audio track on their commercials uh, that for a while, and it's still pretty relevant actually on TikTok, where people were using it as like, man, if you're a 35 to 40 year old dad, you know, what do you do? Wake up Saturday morning, you kind of stand at the you know glass window looking outside and you're just ready to do home improvement. Right. And people would share, you know, videos of their dads doing this. Right. Or even older dads with the, the Home Depot audio track embedded in TikTok. Right. And I'm a huge fan on TikTok. We, we won't talk about that because that's a long story. But uh, it's so audio and it's so great. Right. And for a brand's audio track from commercials to go you know, viral on TikTok, that just shows the power, right, of, of, of what audio can do. And that's why TikTok is so strong, because it's the visual and the audio, but Home Depot's had successes. We've had successes on TikTok where our jingle has gone viral too, without us actually even doing anything on TikTok, which is kind of great. But back to Home Depot and back to what, what Steve was mentioning about diversity, uh, our clients at Home Depot for, for a while, when I was on the agency side, they made a conceited effort to, of course, work on Spanish language work, Right. And even in the in-store experience, right, knowing that a lot of the, you know, uh, people and, and the target that go to Home Depot, especially contractors, professionals, you know, they have a whole set area. There would actually be, you know, voiceovers and music at Home Depot in Spanish. Right. Which catered specifically to the Hispanic demographic and, and back to diversity. Agree, Steve, we need more of that and it needs to be talked about more. But that that goes even a step further. It's not just about the audio, but even in language. Right. And then lastly, I'll say we've been testing some stuff at Avocados from Mexico that have also been in, you know, more tech uh, spaces. But for example, we tested a, a chat bot and then we uh, saw some successes and then we added a personality to it. And then now we're looking at, you know, in, and already in our website have instances where if you want to look up a recipe, you can have, you know, actually this chat bot personality who has a name and face and everything. Right. 
actually read you the steps, right? Because we envision someone having an Alexa or Google Home in their kitchen, and they're like, hey, what's the recipes for a guac, right? How to make a guac. And, and Avocados from Mexico can enter in as a brand and voice over a recipe as people are actually making it, right? So just a very small tactical example of some things we've started to test, but it combines the audio, the you know utility piece, and it's definitely great. And I wish we could do more on that and, and more to come, but, but definitely exciting that we're connecting all things audio uh, and tech. Yeah, I, that is amazing to hear. I just want to say uh, we have someone saying she totally agrees with everything we're talking about. Okay, Joe, anything to add here? You've been listening to these three gentlemen in terms of, again, where does kind of voice and music and sound fit into branding now and into the future? Well, I think a lot of people underestimate the power of the second screen. Just because you say it's a second screen, uh, you know, doesn't mean it has to be a you know some altogether separate experience. Uh, and you have to understand in what instance the second screen may be the TV screen, right? So if you're trying to reach a millennial as a brand and you're advertising in prime time, uh, chances are they're looking at Instagram and that's the first screen that they're doing that 80, 90 percent of the time while they've got some programming on the TV, which is the second screen, right? It doesn't mean that's a bad thing. It just means the way you storytelling needs to be somewhat different. So instead of telling some grandiose story where, you know, I spend a million dollars in TV production out in Portugal, you know, maybe I want to be a little more to the point. Maybe I want my RTBs to come through a little bit more loud and clear and a clear call to action. Because what you're doing in that moment when you're using the, that second screen and you're buying 26 GRP over the course of three weeks, is your, your, you, have the able, you have the ability to talk directly to their subconscious, right? And that's where I might talk to somebody over the course of those 26 GRPs, and they may never recall my TV spot once if I surveyed them after the fact. But chances are, if they go to a bar and I'm, you know, over the course of those 26 GRPs, I'm communicating light, crisp, and refreshing, when they get to a bar three weeks later and they want something that's light, crisp, and refreshing, they're gonna they're gonna call for a Budweiser, right? Yeah, subconsciously, because I've been talking directly into their psyche for three weeks. Um, so there is a massive uh, you know opportunity there if people are willing to kind of you know humble themselves and get out of this like I need to tell a Super Bowl spot in every single TV spot that I make. You know, go in there with an actual functional TV spot that's designed to sell product. Uh, you can use that that second screen and the audio device mechanism within it to actually move units. Yes, I uh, I hope people that are watching and listening now or later are taking a ton of notes because a lot of this is just not only great concepts, but things that can be put into action as well. Um, you know, we are talking again about this kind of advancement of technology um, in terms of, again, AI, voice, VR, AR, all these different things that we're seeing. Uh, for a lot of people or brands, it can feel maybe overwhelming sometimes, not sure where to start or what to do. Um, some try it, some don't, some try it, it doesn't work. So the question is, you know, how do we continue to stand out in an innovative way with all of this change in terms of technology. So um, Jorge, I'm gonna start with you on this question. Do you have any tips or actionable steps that you can think of, or even maybe examples of ways that you're seeing people do this? How do they stay innovative when technology is constantly changing and things are coming about? I think one of the things is always uh, making an effort to stay on top of trends, right? Like things like that pop up even in audio like Clubhouse, right? So that was popular for like a hot second, right? And then everyone tried to compete and, and copy, right? But I think we as a brand also saw, oh, this could be a great opportunity, right? Uh, we could bring chefs, we can do recipes, it's great. But then, you know, some of the times you, you want to jump on trends and you might have a good strategy, but then by itself kind of the 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 usage of certain apps or technologies start falling down right i think that's what you have to kind of measure is and and having a criteria is is it the right time is it on strategy and and you know is it right uh timing right timing is huge so i think you know clubhouse some brands have activated more but then I'll, I'll have to go back to like tiktok right and i think what's so strong about tiktok again is the influencer piece right so if there's any I guess recommendations I would give as I'm a huge proponent of influencers because it's the most, you know, reliable and traditional way of marketing, which is word of mouth. 
right? I don't think there's anything stronger than someone going to, uh, you know, their friends in either real life or on social and saying, hey, try this product out, or I've tried this product out, let me try it. I think there was a study done that more than like 50% of products that are advertised on TikTok actually get bought, you know, showing that it's got that power, right? So even if you're a small brand, I would recommend look to see who are those true advocates that you can have. And, you know, some sometimes it's an efficient way you can have other people do the branding, for you, right? Especially if they fit to your aesthetic, they fit to your brand, have them be the voice, right? Sometimes there's high costs associated, right? As opposed to like other traditional or, or you know, digital mechanisms or media tactics. But, but uh, yeah, I would say have the people do the marketing for you. And that's a beautiful relationship because people will see the genuineness if you pick the right people and they'll do all the work for you. And just, you could just kind of sit and, and see people, you know, uh, on TikTok sharing your product for you, which is awesome. Yeah, I actually, uh, I bought, they, they were called the TikTok yoga pants. I don't even know who made them, but if you know what I'm talking about, uh, everyone had them and was doing videos and I failed to bought them as well. So <laughs> it, that's a perfect example of branding. Yeah. I don't even need to know the company, but I went to their website, purchased them. They were sold out completely. So um, Steve, coming back to you. So again, this same question of uh, you know, how do you suggest a brand continues to stand out in an innovative way with the constant changes with technology? Do you have any kind of actionable tips or suggestions or examples? Well, I, I think it comes back to, uh, you know, again, thinking about what is the essence of the brand? Um, what's the brand meaning? Uh, and looking for ways to use technology and innovation um, that's consistent with with the brand. You know, I, th I think that's the danger of sometimes hopping on trends. If it's not really aligned with your brand meaning and purpose, it can feel like it's a gimmick uh, at the end of the day. You might capture attention for a moment, uh, but that's different than really kind of building your, your brand salience. So particularly when we're working with our clients and thinking about innovation from an audio standpoint, we're trying to look at what are things that are true to the brand. Um, you know, how could we use uh, an application that might deliver a couple of different soundscapes for you as you're um, playing around with uh, preparing a meal? Uh, and how might those soundscapes affect uh, the atmosphere in which you're delivering the meal? Or how might they actually literally change the perception of flavor? You know, we did that with Propel in an activation where we helped build an app. We had a, salt, a soundscape for electrolytes and a soundscape for uh, fruit, which was basically salt and sweetness. And so uh, consumers at an event could drink their Propel, move this fader and look at us like, what is this dark magic you're doing here? Because I'm drinking out of the same bottle, but it tastes different. Uh, you know, so, so again, this is all about experiences. So using the innovation in a way that creates unique consumer experiences uh, that fits into your brand narrative. And if it brings something meaningful to life, uh, you know, I think healthcare brands can, can get into this even more using innovative technology that, that might, um, you know, have an impact on our health and, and well-being. Uh, those are, are ways in which you can draw consumers into your brand, build that brand love, um, because it can become part of their lived experience. Uh, and so, you know, AI tech technology is allowing us to do things um, that we had only dreamed of before. But I think the key again is how is it true and consistent with the essence of the brand um, because it's the perception of the brand at the end of the day, as Joe said, what happens in the mind of the consumer is the brand, not what happens in the mind of the marketer. Yes. Uh, and I agree. I think you're right in saying you got to pick, it's not about just a gimmick or just doing it because it's out, making sure it's the right fit for you. CJ, anything to add here again, in terms of how does a brand stand out and stay innovative when the world is constantly bringing in new types of technology? Yeah, I agree with um, everything that has been said so far. Oh, hey, bring up great point about the creative team should always be exploring and then think about what are the possibility for us here. 
and Steve was talking, saying great things about making sure it is on brand, right? Stay with the brand essence. You don't want to be chasing something and then lose your, your brand focus. And that it, both of those are great, great uh, advice. So I, when I talk to my clients, my advice for them is this. People don't care about your product. They care about their problems. Meaning what they actually purchase your product or use your service, what is the problem they are trying to solve? So technology, a lot of time can help you focus on help them solve their problem. For example, uh, I'm going to bring a few examples like Nike Plus, right? Nike Plus is a platform. They literally created connected sports because that's why people bought their products. They, that's why they bought their running shoes. So they realize the problem is it's a lonely game if you're just running by yourself. So they connect the like-minded people together, have a little friendly competition, and all of a sudden that becomes a platform that people love to use and that enhance your brand value. It's not the product itself, but enhance the brand value. IKEA Place is another great example. Why people go to IKEA? They want to purchase something, furniture, bring it to their house. And what's the problem? They don't know what it looks like. So they give them a way to visualize it in their own space. And then that helps you increase the brand value because people then understand the brand cares about what I want to do, do or achieve. Nike Crime is another great example. The wine label, why people drink wine? They want to be entertained. So they have this AR, uh, VR app that you scan it and the villains start talking, they, they tell you their story. Again, they want to be entertained when they open the bottom line and that brand does that. So it is all about relevancy. Technology, new, great. But how do you build that relevancy that bring, uh, connect your brand and its audiences? I am CJ. You're giving some tremendous examples. I, you know, things are just resonating in a visual way for me, and just being like, oh, that that makes so much sense. Joe, anything to add here? How do you stay innovative from a brand perspective with all this new technology that's coming out? Um, I'd say pay attention to tectonic shifts and then be customer centric kind of in the same breath. So um, Jorge, I'll bring you in as an example because we're buddies from another life. Uh, we used to work together on the Budweiser brand. Imagine a world in which, um, you know, me and you are both coming home from work one day and we decide we want to get together at a bar, right? So we go, we meet, we meet up, uh, we're at a bar. It's like the bar, the bars that we used to hang out at in New York. Uh, except, you know, zoom out uh, to a 30,000 foot view. And it's not me and you meeting at a bar in New York, actually, physically. It's me in my apartment in Beverly Hills, and it's you uh, in your house. We've just got a virtual headset on, and we both picked up a six pack of Budweiser on the way home, right? That future's not very far off, right? We, you know, we could have never had a pandemic in 2008 because of the ability to compute data. We Our, our entire con economy would have collapsed. But because it happened in the year 2020, we sped up the technology by about five years. So what should be, we should be on a pathway to that type of an engagement by 2030 naturally, that will now be here in 2024, 2025. So if I'm a brand and I'm a service-based brand or I'm somebody, I'm a brand that's based on customer experience, uh, the shared enjoyment of my product or service, I want to go out and buy as much beachfront real estate as I can in a place like Oculus Rift. Uh, Oculus Rift. I'm actually quite shocked that Zoom hasn't been purchased by Facebook or Google yet, uh, because that is where we're headed. We're headed to this place where you know physical and virtual are going to start mingling more and more and more. And the brands that understand that and start laying the foundation now and start doing the executions, despite how little ROI there is in it right now. Uh, they're going to see the biggest yield and the biggest dividends five years from now when that becomes the norm and they become associated with how cool that brand is because they got in early. Um, that's just kind of my my quick advice on the on the topic. But we're we're definitely headed down that path. The the pandemic has spelled the arrival of virtual and augmented in a real way, and it's going to be a lot faster than you think. Yes, I 100% agree. We are a little bit over time. I do want to have one audience question and then we will finish up here. PK asks, how do you know when it's the right time to rebrand yourself and choose a different direction? So that could be either, you know, personal branding or that could be maybe a company, a startup. Um, any thoughts here, Steve, on this one? Wow. Uh, that's... Boy, that's that's tough. Um, 
I would, you know, I would say if, if you're just not getting any traction at all, you know, if you're looking at metrics and you're seeing, you know, there's no recognition of the brand um, and you're, you're seeing the, you know, the, the sales uh, lag as a result, um, you know, I, I think you have to, to measure what, what is the problem around the experience again? And, you know, what does rebranding mean? Are you going to change the name? Are you going to change assets? Um, there's a whole lot that to unpack in that. And I'm not sure that I really answered that question. Uh, so let's, let's let uh, Orge and CJ and, and, and Joe see if they can do a little bit. Of it, it's yeah, not an easy there's... one. Like to save you, Steve, it's not easy, right? Yeah. I think as a brand, you, you don't want you back to one of my first points when we started was consistency, right? So you don't want to be constantly changing because then people won't recognize you or won't understand that that's what you stood for at one point, right? So I'll say that that being now uh, part of two big brands or two, a big brand and a smaller brand, I think it's it's almost like you could equate it to like the seven year itch, right? Like in marriage, right? You have to like get to a point where like you've, you've given it more than five years and, and you have to assess, okay, is it time to maybe refresh things, right? And brands do this occasionally, especially from like a logo standpoint, right? And to CJ's point, logo is the easiest thing to think the shining on the cake, but it's, and it's what people gravitate, but there's more to it, right? And to Steve points, there's so many things you have to think about, you know, fonts, colors, backgrounds, like it's a lot, right? So it's a lot of dollars if you think about it, right? To update anything. But I think, you know, anywhere from like seven years, you maybe want to think if there's, if, if you're a brand and, and then also there's ways where brands shift to what's happening, right? To Joe's point, we did work uh, together at Budweiser, but I'm still pretty in, into what's happening in the beer space and everything's moving to seltzer, right? So one of the things that my, my old friends at Bud Light have done is, well, if everyone's drinking seltzer, let's launch Bud Light Seltzer, right? Because they have the power and they're seeing the trends and, you know, that's a brand pivot that's it's still Bud Light. Uh, but in a seltzer format in teas and lemonades and things like that. So, so I think that's, that's, you know, some things to think about there that it's hard to change brands. You want to be consistent, but there are times where you have to kind of shift to what the market's doing. Joe, anything to add to that? Yeah. Uh, John Laguerre, a former T-Mobile CEO, used to have a red phone on his desk and every time he picked it up, it was just customers. Uh, it was customer, uh, customer service complaint lines. So back to the, your brand isn't what you say it is, it's what your consumers say it is. Listen to your customer and figure out what they're saying about your brand. And in a lot of cases, some of the best innovations come out of that as well, right? That's That line of thinking is what led to them going all in on unlimited everything at T-Mobile, which allowed them to creep up and start taking over mindshare from uh, brands like AT&T and Sprint. Um, so really dial in, uh, you know, you can't be afraid of customer feedback. That's the number one rule, like customers are there, uh, their feedback is important. You have to listen to it and you have to react to it. You might as well use it as an opportunity to grow as a brand. Um, and those things can signal, you know, like if I had enough, if I was picking up a customer service line and listening to angry complaints, you know, if I had enough of them and, and I wasn't, you know, if I wasn't hearing enough positivity, that might be a signal to that we need to do something to our brand, whether it's a full scale rebrand or and relaunch or making slight tweaks and optimizations. Uh, but I'm much more of like a, a intuitive kind of just go after what the customers think kind of guy versus, you know, fielding massive studies and stuff like that. Just listen to your customers, see what they have to say. Yeah. CG, anything to add to that as well? Yeah, I think that's a great point about listening and, mm -hmm. and social listening is a lot easier to do these days as well. I think brand really should pay attention to that and respect that. And besides that, I want to add, um, in my experience, uh, a lot of the time rebrand was driven or necessity of a rebrand was driven by cultural paradigm shift because the cultural paradigm shift and change how people consume or how people purchase, that is... Uh, um, a, a lot of time the trigger for the necessity. i give you an example with this uh, brand I work with, uh, Gond. It's a legendary American toy maker. They make the softest teddy bear. They were the first company in the United States to design and produce soft teddy bear. And uh, they used to um, create or build their brand on tactile feelings because they, they do. They have the softest teddy bear. But they starting to struggle in 2000 and 2014 They reach out to us say, uh, I think we need a social media campaign. And me being me, says, why do you think you need a social media campaign? <laughs> then we start discussing and we do our research. And I went back and say, you don't need a social media campaign. You need a complete rebrand. 
because behind the glass, every teddy bear feels the same. So your advantage for your product is lost in the digital age. How can you communicate that softness, that caring through a complete different tone of voice, a different persona, including the different logo? And we help them rebrand. We launched the rebranding in 2016. In 2018, the, the sales are way up and they got purchased by Swim Master, which is a giant in the toy uh, industry for $80 million. So really branding helped them rebuild and then revitalize this uh, legendary brand. And uh, it was totally driven by the, the, the consumer behavior change. Now, I, all of you are such a wealth of information and so much passion behind what you do. We could talk for hours, and I'm so grateful you all were here. If people want to learn more about anything we discussed, where is the best place to connect or learn more? Joe, I'll start with you. Uh, if you go to Google and you just type in Super Quattrone, that's super, and then my last name, <laughs> Uh, that's pretty much the handle I use for every platform I'm on. Uh, I'm most active on LinkedIn. So if you, you want to go hit me up there, I'm more likely to respond to your DMs or comments within about a day. Um, most of my, you don't want to be on my Instagram anyway, it's just pictures of my kids. So uh, yeah, super question on Google. Fastest way to find me. I love the brand. Jorge, where can people love connect it. with you? Um, yeah, also like Joe, very active on LinkedIn. You could literally type Jorge Avocados from Mexico. I'm the only one. Um, and then I'll do a shameless plug for my Instagram because uh, it's a lot about running uh, and it's a long one, but memorable. I know you know this one, Carrie. My Instagram is my name is Jorge and I like to run. Yes, that long. <laughs> my name is Jorge and I like to run. Check it out for running content. Super Quattrone and my name is Jorge and I like to run. CJ, where can people connect with you and learn more? Yeah, LinkedIn is probably the best place. CJ, yeah, I'm probably not the only CJ yet, but uh, <laughs> I'm probably the only one that's in design and teaching. So uh, you can find me easily. Or you can come to FIT's website, fitnyc.edu. You can find my profile there and connect with me. Perfect. And Steve, where can people connect with you as well? Uh, LinkedIn as well. Uh, just uh, you know, search for Steve Keller and probably throw in SXM or Pandora uh, and it'll pop up. Uh, I am pretty active on uh, Twitter as well. So I'm audio alchemist underscore. Don't forget the underscore there. Uh, and I'll also put a plug in. If you want to know more about the sonic diversity that I chatted about, um, go to uh, standforsonicdiversity.com. Uh, and that'll uh, show you more about the initiative that we're doing and how we're trying to get advertisers and brands and, and agencies um, more aware uh, and, and committed to a more sonically diverse uh, universe in our world. Perfect. Well, I thank you all so much for being here. And I definitely look forward to having you all back again soon. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you for you. having us, Carrie. Thank you. Bye, CJ. Bye, Steve. Bye, Joe. Thank and you. And if guys. you are watching and listening, don't forget to subscribe to our Read Speaker AI YouTube page for more videos, as well as our Creative and Tech podcast show wherever you listen to podcasts and continue to watch the rest of our Branding Innovators event today and tomorrow.